helpless. I could heal myself while helping to stop and heal these poor kids. I started telling anything to everyone, anyone that wanted to hear. I could be helped to, or I thought that I needed help. The more I talked about it to others, the more others opened up about themselves being abused. <coughs> that was when it finally hit me that this was a plague, not an isolated violence. There's strength in numbers. The tragedy of this story, though, was that my mom hadn't realized that a snake had invaded her house. And that while she was off in courtrooms helping other kids, my pedophile cousin was at home abusing me. My mom and I didn't talk about that for years. She talked about this process. She said, I spent all those years thinking that I would never ever let anything like this happen to my children. I naively was grateful when I had sons because I'd never truly been educated on the subject of male sexual abuse. I thought between me being open about it and being watchful that they would never be hurt. When I found out, I was devastated. To think I was so damn stupid as to let a snake into my home and have it attack my son right underneath my eyes. In hindsight, it's even sadder because while this was going on, it was the time I was coming out from behind my own wall grief. And damn it, if it wasn't happening all over again. How did I let it happen? How could I dismember this asshole without going to prison? You can hurt me, and nobody messes with my kids. You don't mess with my boys. I felt that I had totally let you down, and wondered why you hadn't told me <coughs> sooner. Yet part of me also understands. The problem with snakes and the problem with silence is that families are filled with snakes. And about ten years after my cousin had abused me, we had another cousin move into my home. And who repeatedly raped my mother in her own home, right under the watch of her own husband. My mom goes on to talk about this, saying, I didn't have the support of Dave to help me through my rape by Joe Estefan. All I had from was, quote, well, we told you it was a piece of crap. It was you who kept wanting him to stay here. Those repeated comments just bring up all the child reactions of you in blame. It's your fault, not Joe's. I still, to this day, do not feel secure. I learned through many years of counseling that my reaction at the time was one of guilt and don't say anything. Being sexually abused as a child, you believe that you're the guilty person and there's something wrong with you. This is drummed into your head by the perpetrators. The fact that I didn't say anything or press charges leads me to believe that he's still out wandering the streets of this town 24-7. Being related also may have been part of conversations at times. Secure, not then, and not now. It doesn't hurt your physical being, but it kills your soul. The biggest problem with this situation, and one of the great tragedies when it comes to rape and sexual assault, is it resulted in a pregnancy. And my mom had some really hard decisions to have to face at the time, and didn't have an ounce of support from anyone. She says, when you load on top of that, that the pregnancy and abortion performed on someone who found out that although she's very pro-choice, she still can't love herself after having killed her child. It was half creature, but it was also half me. And I made a conscious decision to kill her. Even though it took me two trip, three trips to the abortion clinic before I could go through with it. God forgives us for everything, if we ask for it. But I still can't convince, can forgive myself. Did the rape leave scars on me, or the abortion? And how can the man who's supposed to love you all these years blame you and leave you in this mess? Because what that rape and abortion turned into was it put up a wall of silence between my parents. And eventually they divorced. Throughout this process, my mom tried to find new ways of healing. One of the great problems for anyone who's been a victim of violence is the temptation for vengeance. She talked about this phenomenon very openly, saying, I hate guns, but I remember talking to Cameron about buying one off. One of the reasons being is I once confronted Joe Estefan. And that man owns a gun. 
might have been thrown in public as a rapist. He went out to his gun, car to get a gun and to come shoot me down. And I thank God that a bartender overheard that conversation saved my life that night. She goes and says, never did I, did I, of course. I held the hurt and guilt buried as deep inside it as could be done without running into him all the time. I also didn't have the support of Dave to help me through it. I used to consider myself a victim. I'm now a proud survivor. I would get on the highest mountain and shout it to the entire world. But to this day, the chains are gone. Let me tell you how good it feels and how I'm free. To the day my mom died, I never told her a word about her brother. I put an end to the abuse and figured that it had no purpose except to upset her. I couldn't do that to her. I loved her too much. I figured the fact that, well, She's in heaven, and Uncle Arden isn't anywhere to be a found. I assume she's figured out that he's a schmuck, and he ended up in another place. I always wondered, though, if my dad was watching over me during those years and was aghast at what was going on down here after he left me. I hope he didn't have to sit helpless and watch. One of the reasons why my mother is one of my greatest heroes is since breaking the silence on this and losing everything. She's dedicated her life to try and help other people. When I asked her if she had any advice for people who are experiencing domestic violence or sexual assault, or witnessing this in other people's lives, she says, quote, This isn't the end of your life, a big speed bump maybe, but be strong and believe in yourself and your worth. You have to expose the devil before you can fight the devil. Sexual abuse and assault is the silent killer of your soul. There's strength in numbers, both physical and mental. If we refuse to be silent, we can no longer be tucked away in the corner, ignored, or blamed. What's the old saying? Out of sight, out of mind. Breaking the silence together strengthens you in awareness. We as a people loving and caring have to not ever let this cause be shoved out of sight. How did we validate the Holocaust? We took pictures. We exposed it for what it was. We exposed the people responsible. We broke the silence. Show the world that there's consequences to perversions. Unless we vow to do this, then atrocities such as big abuse, molestations, and yes, even the Holocaust, will always creep in the corners of the night. Have faith in yourself and in each other. If we break the silence, we can end the violence. Let me tell you about my greatest hero, though, and the woman who saved my life and transformed my life that I wouldn't be standing here today without, is my wife, Libby Booth. <coughs> to give you some context, very similar to my own mother's experience, working class family means that both parents have to work, and if you work at the same place, it means you've got to take dual shifts, which means that oftentimes kids are left at home alone. What began to happen when Libby was only three years old was her older brother, Bill, started instigating games. And when mom and dad weren't looking from the ages of three to nine, Bill transformed these games to full-on sexual abuse. One of the problems with this is that when Libby finally broke down and told her mother about what was going on, they helped to bring the violence to an end. But the family never dealt with that. And what happened with Bill that day? Dad said that what he had done was wrong, took him out back with the belt, gave him a hell of a beating. So Bill stopped doing these things. But the family never opened up about it and never healed. And so my poor wife had to suffer and to internalize that pain. And with three years of self-destruction coming out of it. One of the reasons why she's my hero is the victim can transform that negative energy and become a survivor. And let me tell you a story about the year 2006. Living in Saginaw, Michigan, I was volunteering for a woman's shelter called the Underground Railroad. I went to a fundraising event. I saw the most beautiful woman I'd ever seen in my life. 
she saw me. And I don't talk about this in our meeting. I talk about this as us being reunited. Because what happened is we instantly connected with each other's souls. I'll give you a quote from a song here from a piece called Heaven, a song called The Origin of Love. Uh, I share this with you because it was part of our wedding vows. It explains much about our experience together. It says, I could swear by your expression the pain out of your soul was the same as the one out of mine. It's the pain that cuts a straight line down to the heart. We call it love. We wrap our arms around each other. Try to shove ourselves back together. That's the origin of love. When we met each other, we we're both alcoholics. We we're both suicidal. We we're both going down a pain and a path of self destruction. We quite literally changed, saved each other's lives, and transformed each other's lives. Because we instantly connected. We instantly shared our stories and instantly decided to empower each other, empower each ourselves, to dedicate our lives to empowering every single person we came across. What we've done with our entire marriage is try and provide education, shelter, and support for people who have gone through this to break the silence. And one of the reasons why I can say that my wife is truly my hero and has the biggest heart of any woman I've ever known that we got a call on Friday night this last weekend. A frantic call from my mother-in-law that Bill had locked himself away in a bathroom with a pistol in his mouth and was going to kill himself over the guilt of what he'd done and how his entire life he's been a screw. And what did Libby do? She called up Bill. She talked him down for three hours. He saved his life, and I've got to openly admit, I was sitting in the next room, hoping he'd hang up and pull that trigger. I'm ashamed to say that, but that's the reality. My wife has a much bigger heart than me. She reached out to her perpetrator. She saved her older brother's life. I'm hoping now that Bill will become a repentant perpetrator and help to heal this cycle of violence. I'd like to end you off with a couple of quotes today. One of the most famous historians of Nazi Germany in the Holocaust, a man by the name of Ian Kershaw, once stated, The road to Auschwitz was built upon hate, but paved with indifference, it was silence. As human beings, we have the great capacity for amazing acts of compassion and kindness and charity. But we also have the potential of allowing great evil to happen. When we say it's happening to somebody else, we keep our mouths silent, and we look the other way. And I can tell you as a historian studying tragedies over and over throughout history, Ian Kershaw is right. It's not an isolated incident with Auschwitz. Almost every human tragedy has happened throughout history because people were silent and they looked the other way. But I can also tell you something else. Let me introduce you to my fourth hero. I think you've all probably met, heard of this girl before. Uh, I had a great blessing when I was 16 years old. I was in high school. As I started off as an actor. I had an opportunity as a 16-year-old to direct a production of The Diary of Anne Frank. When I read this young girl's story, I decided to dedicate the rest of my life to trying to learn about the Nazis, learn about the Holocaust, and ask the great question, could this young girl have been saved? And one of the things that transformed my life, and why Anne Frank is a great hero of mine, is I can't even imagine writing these words when you're sitting in an attic in Amsterdam, terrified for your life. The fact that a young teenager could write, quote, despite everything, I believe that people are really good at heart. Everyone has inside of them a piece of good news. The good news is that you don't know how great you can be, how much you can love, what you can accomplish, and what your potential is. I don't think of all the misery, but all the beauty that still remains. Unfortunately, she never got out of that life out. But what I can tell you, though, about the legacy of somebody like Anne Frank, 
I don't have a shining cloud here, a great story to wrap this up with, to leave you with something feeling good. But I can tell you one thing, you as a human being, you've got a lot of power. I'd like to openly invite you. Thursday, at the Fountain here on Dixie Campus, Dixie State College, is holding its first annual Take Back the Night event. It's a public rally against domestic violence, sexual assault, and abuse, where communities come together. We break the silence on this issue, and we let perpetrators know that their violence is not acceptable in our community, period. Violence is inherently unchristian in a good Christian community. It should not be tolerated. You should not look the other way. And don't ever allow yourself to be silent. I welcome all of you to come out on Thursday night. Break the silence. And I can guarantee you, after watching this movement for a number of years, that if you come out this year, then come out next year, and come out the year after that, perpetrators are cowards. They won't feel safe. And the numbers will start dropping in our community. The power's up to you. Thank you.